This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start with one observation, um, listening to all of these summaries, which is about the importance of place and space that seems to have come up in all three discussions. So I was thinking in our, um, I was in the um, session with Sam, so discussing the poems, and something that was really interesting that came out in our discussion is the way that the poems were able to convey a sense of physical place. So we have this um, really lovely description in the second poem of the snails and the spiders spinning their webs and moths and this kind of imagery of the graveyard. Um, but it also conveys this sense of imagined place as well. So we have the state of limbo, and um, also kind of heaven is vaguely alluded to, but really of, and the challenge of trying to imagine a place that is no place or something that is nothing. And, um, so the poems did that really well. So there's this kind of physical place or space and also imagined space. Um, and that seemed to also come out. Um, I have actually read the, um, the, the novel um, that Frank was discussing eight years and years ago, so I can't remember it very well. Um, but again, it seems that there's importance of place. And you're talking about kind of national context, you know, the kind of place and the land. But also, um, I was thinking about the imagery of the train, but also the um, of the, the unborn child. And there's, the womb is then a kind of imagined place or space. So again, that seems to capture that well. Um, and also you're talking about being the kind of imagery of the room and being cluttered and cramped. And it just struck me as that's something that literature can really do, I think, which is convey, you get a kind of sense of a physical place, but also it kind of maybe gives us tools for imagining spaces, so that kind of liminality or um, the imagined space of the room, and actually start to kind of vocalise or articulate what we're what we're imagining or what's in the back of our minds when we're thinking about these things. So I don't know if anyone else wanted to. It seems to be potentially the most important thing that we're trying to do in the to recently considering it in terms of being a novel about religion. <coughs> and it made me think, what is so, in a way, what is what makes religion a category of its own in a way? So how is religion kind of not 
the same as thinking about migration or, or particular cultures. So what is it that makes us think that religion is this special category? Um, but also then thinking as well, you know, we've, di we've divided out religion and spirituality as well. So I was just thinking about, I don't know, maybe how the novels, you know, do they convey, do they, do they use the language of religion? Do they discuss religion and spirituality? Or is that something that we're, you know, we're then categorizing, so we're saying this is not about religion. And that's obviously to impose a certain idea on some of what religion is, anyway. So I was wondering if you can know, that. I didn't say it was read as a novel of religion. No, well, I said was that critics recently realized there are religious elements in there that are really worth discussing, yeah. not just immigration. Mm -hmm. It is a different prism, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can actually you can read it at a different level. If you, if you want to read it as a migration novel and her exploration of her identity as a migrant, it is not necessarily dissociated from her identity mm -hmm. as, as a Muslim uh, and so on, but it, it's, it's what you give, I guess, importance to. Mm -hmm. So it's a different sort of, um, it's a different lens that you can apply. It's interesting the idea that there is that we can almost kind of separate out so we can, mm -hmm. that there are these kind of very distinct interpretive prisms or lenses mm -hmm. in one's called religion and one's called culture. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's what I'm interested in. It might be more difficult if, if certain categories are, are misassumed to belong to some categories and not others. Mm -hmm. Actually, in some ways, so religion is often yes. kind of collapsed mm -hmm. and critically. Um, with ethnicity or national identity, mm -hmm. and actually sometimes it does help to, to, to pull it out and to see what difference it makes. But at the same time, you know, this, you know this sexuality can, those kind of paradigm frames can, can help us see how those, how those different uh, identity groups are oh, complex and they do not really need to change. So, I'm just kind of, I'm, I guess I'm, I just tend to be aware when religion is too easily hidden amongst other narratives mm -hmm. of, of yeah. practice, belonging, identity, mm -hmm. um, which sometimes it's, it's helpful to look at. But I would say that, so I think that would be the job. One thing that didn't come up in the summary that we talked about a lot was that the the narrative stops at the point at which she is migrating into Germany. So it's not to do with the move into Germany, it's more to do with crossing different cultural boundaries within Turkey. And the, the space thing that you picked up on, um, you know, not only is the child in the, the fetus in the womb, but it's standing upright <laughs> and there are soldiers around and it's hanging onto some sort of ice between yes. some ice or holes. Ice holes. It's very, very strange. So it's this extraordinary imaginary mm. space. But also the title suggests nomadism because mm. it's Caravanan mm. I can't say it. Mm. Um, but it's a nomadic mm. uh, movement rather than a movement from one separate place to another separate so it's sort of, and it ends with soldiers as well, doesn't it? So it's this kind of framework, but it's a framework to do with movement. And yes, yeah, it's, it's very appealing, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, it's strange. Um, an interesting thing that the French extract draws is that within a very short space of time, you know, two women who at the very beginning are starkly juxtaposed against one another, women being um, a very strict orthodox Jew, and then Barbara, a much more liberated, modern, secular mother. And in the beginning, we think they couldn't possibly have anything in common because they have two um, completely different approaches to motherhood, one being um, conformist, um, in the case of uh, Miriam and um, the other being a bit more transgressive in the case of Barbara. But then by the end of the extract, they're almost aligned in their experiences. And in fact, there's an interesting part in the extract where Barbara has all these questions racing around her head. Um, how does she do it? What about incontinence? What about this? What about that? She doesn't voice them. And then, without them being voiced, Miriam gives her the answers. And that's a really nice alignment, I think, of two positions of motherhood that at the beginning see the polar opposites of one another and then towards the end of the extract come together. So 
it shows or I think illustrates or suggests that you know you don't have to presume that um, religious mothering is going to be completely different from secular mothering that they can share um, concerns and um, experiences. I think this is particularly important. I mean, I pick up on this kind of idea in my own research, but I think this has something to say for feminist readings of religion in particular. Um, and I think it's really important actually to keep in mind because I think there is this at least traditional tendency in quite a lot of feminist critique to conceptualize women's religious behaviors and experiences either as <laughs> collusive or subversive. Mm -hmm. And we expect to see one or the other, and if it's going to have a feminist interpretation, it must be subversive. But of course that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually map on to so much a reality. So I, I find that really fascinating. I mean, the, again, within such a short mm -hmm. excerpt, that, that whole structure of expecting women religious women to be one or the other, mm -hmm. and, and as mothers. Mm -hmm. You just cannot actually make that distinction by the end. Mm -hmm. I think, and again, yeah, it has been really important to say to feminist scholarship in particular. Mm -hmm. Certain types of feminist scholarship. Mm -hmm. So what you were saying, you expect to be challenged on something that's another, yeah. different, not supposed to reshape what you know about mm -hmm. the film mm -hmm. and the film. Actually, sometimes it's still similar, but it's <laughs> upsetting it. <laughs> and kind of control. I found it a little strange in the advocacy text, and perhaps those of you discussed it to explain it to me. Um, if I were asked if everything's going well, um, the reply from the minute is that the children are the whole life. Mm -hmm. And Barbara immediately assumes that this means they have children and they were happy. Mm -hmm. well, why does she assume? Because it might not have the case. I mean, many of them also say, well, actually, they're not going to happy that they yeah. get through. Mm -hmm. And she's, again, it, in one way it brings them together because they both, I think, lost their husbands exactly mm -hmm. their children to one degree or another. Why does she make that odd leap? I think that's the answer that she wants to hear. She's, yeah, she's, she's going through really such a chaotic um, experience as a new mother and, you know, she's receiving conflicting messages of how to be a good mother from various sources and she wants to find in Miriam the answer um, and the answer is to give up your own identity and become a mother to the children, and that's it. That's what yeah, Miriam really seems to be telling we, us. We discussed that, we discussed the fact that quite a nice break in the text, you know, physical break in the text about, you know, it all my whole life, and then um, Barbara's reflection on that, and then the real answer. We were talking about how, so what does that whole life really mean? And yeah. it's actually, it's not a perfect solution, and actually, it's his trouble. So, so, yeah. so, 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 kind of critique of that actually does come through that same point. Mm -hmm. It's obviously that Barbara, you know, she, in the first part of the text, she wants these answers, and then later on, she doesn't want to really to hear it. She wants um, Miriam to tell her, I know how to do it, I've got the solution, these are the rules, and if you abide by them, you'll be, you know, everything will be hokey joy. And me kind of, yeah, I think it's a very naive um, reaction, full of expectation on the part of, of Barbara. But that's what we talk about being two, lots of different truths, different truths being said in that, they're my whole life. Yeah, the so it's a reading of so it's a positive and a negative reading. Yeah. But Barbara, Barbara presumes it's the positive one because that's what she wants to hear. But tradition is often sought when Christ's moment is seen. You see that in politics, so we can revert, revert back to the traditional way of doing things or nostalgia for old, old practices. So it's a sort of return to the past and, 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 and sort of a, you know, a re-glorification of that, which is mm -hmm. necessarily helpful. I'm just wondering if there's any biblical intertext here because in the Bible, Miriam was the name of the mother of Jesus, and she just had one child. Um, but here, it's the Miriam is the one who has the ten children. Has, has the ten children. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if biblical scholars know what would there be any thing we should be picking up on the name Barbara. I don't know if they're Barbara. Yeah. 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 But Miriam is a mission, Moses' sister. Mm -hmm. That's the first Miriam. We don't know. How many children she doesn't have, if any. So I think, I think Jesus' mother is named after her. that Miriam in the Old Testament. Does it mention the Kabbalah? Is that being mentioned? That's the book of prayers. Yes. And, and it's, for me, what was interesting with reference to that was that it's 
primarily associated with um, husband in the extract. Um, so one of the things that we talked about was that in this kind of tradition of um, parenting, um, it would seem that the mother gets relegated to the private of the body, whereas the father, the male parent, is allowed to, um, he's associated with teaching and reading the Kabbalah at the very start of the, he's got some scholars in, um, and they're discussing it, and he said he's associated with the, the mind, um, and that, that's what we talked about in, in relation to that. The Kabbalah is very spruce, mystical mm -hmm. aspect. It's more than philosophical. It's mystical. Mm -hmm. It's mystical. I was smart because for us it's Madonna who's mm -hmm. most associated mm -hmm. with that <laughs> song. That's a very mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. uh, I haven't read the Abbotism for several years, but because it links in, in some respects with the novel I'm going to talk about after some way, the answer is a I think that when she discovers she's pregnant, she refers to having had an annunciation, which is a... <laughs> Does she? Yeah. I'll check up on that. And yeah, think. yeah. So I wanted to know if the film contains this... Um, no, we talked about that. The film arrays in the darker side um, of um, internal ambivalence that um, courses through um, the, the novel and it becomes um, a kind of more sugar-coated representation of um, the experience of mothering. So um, the novel was praised, received great praise when it came out as you know, um, demystifying um, the institution of motherhood um, and providing an alternative and daring to speak the truth, whereas the film has been criticised as being a bit kind of candy floss um, in, in contrast with the book, which is a lot darker. Also, it's so appealing to hear Tanakis' interview on her novel and the filming of it. And there she mentions that uh, in relationship to her own mother, this novel also, um, when she became a mother, it also relates her own experiences of um, how she, um, the relationship between her mother and herself, which was filled with tension, how she resolved some of that. Yeah, so then there are, there are some things in the novel um, between Barbara and, and her mother, and it is um, a conflictual relationship. I can't remember clearly what they talk about, but there's definitely a um, conflict between mother and daughter. And what I wanted to know is that does, because in this extract it seems that the author um, wants to go back to religion. Mm -hmm. As if you know, when I read it, for example, the way she answers that Miriam answers the questions even when the questions have not really been asked. It's as mm -hmm. if the author is trying to say that she knows as much as Barbara for them. Mm -hmm. which, we, which I wonder it happens in real life. Mm -hmm. We are aware of so many questions, whether you would accept all the religious... Uh, and when she says, they are my life, mm -hmm. as a reader you would feel that it's an emotional and, uh, way of saying, they are my life. But mm -hmm. when she goes on with the explanation, then you understand that she, she was not meaning about the spiritual um, mm -hmm. fulfillment. She was telling about the... Yeah, and, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when even as a result, like with an overall view, you feel the author wanted us to read it as a, you know, as if she wanted to say that Miriam is as much aware of things and yet she's accepted that they are mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which you know, sometimes it becomes difficult to accept. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. does when she describes the relationship with her own mother, does this religious point also come across? I, can't, I honestly can't remember very clearly. I know one thing that she complains about in regards to her mother is that her mother doesn't tell her anything, doesn't share any experiences. She constantly complains, why don't you tell me? Um, and here we have Miriam telling her, answering her. Yeah. But I can't remember clearly if there are any religious conversations between Barbara and her mother. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes. I just wanted to. Um, kind of 
the negative discussions we've been having a bit more to the kind of theme or the, the aims of the network as a whole, which is to kind of start to think about the challenges of interdisciplinary dialogue um, in regards to discussions about motherhood. Um, and I was interested by, um, because of what we've found in a lot of um, the workshops so far is how is, you know, we have different kinds of text and how, how do we treat different kinds of text. So, for example, so I this morning presented um, it's kind of real life, real life narratives, um, and then we've had and we'll look at literary texts and the discussions is, you know, how how will different disciplines draw on different kinds of texts for the kind of questions they're asking, and how they be framed, and what kind of things can different kinds of texts offer different studies and so on. Um, so, for example, I'm from the discipline of philosophy, so we might sometimes turn to a literary text to think something we feel we. We can't quite express in the kind of dry old principle language. Um, but, so, but a different kind of text has come up in these discussions, which is religious texts. Um, so I thought it might be quite interesting to just, that adds up in another dimension, isn't it? Are we, treat, are we treating them as literary texts or, you know, it's kind of guidelines? We, um, you know, we assess them, you know, are we treating them in terms of, yeah, that kind of literary techniques or content, and so I think that might add a, a different dimension that's very specific to this workshop that I think makes it unique and interesting. I don't know if anyone, I mean, maybe the religious studies people. Religious them is not actually in read the Bible. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Might be just for people who do read it, but uh, um, I think it's an interesting. I mean, you know, we were talking before about why we, or even within literature, why religion is presented as a kind of self-contained category, and people feel much freer to talk about their spiritual experiences. I think in the uh, second poem, in particular, it's really interesting um, where the or is it the first poem? I'm really sorry. <laughs> oh, it's the first poem. Yeah. She tries to recite, you said it's a line from the, from the catechism. Mm -hmm. So she tries to kind of say this to herself as a part of her mourning process, and it doesn't work. Um, and yet we still wind up within this particular piece of poetry with a you know, quite poignant experience. Which I don't know. I mean, I think we struggle to talk about what happens here. You know, we talked about this being analogous to melancholia because it's so slippery and without um, clear indicators as to how we might categorize what's happening to this woman. And I think that this, well, it's something you know that is problematized within religious studies is to assume that religious texts are self-contained, that they are hermetically sealed, that they aren't as slippery and um, challenging as spiritual experiences. And that comes with its own historical legacy. I mean, you know, I think contemporary religious studies work to break those kinds of distinctions down. But I think it is fascinating, I think it is something that, you know, you have with literature like this in particular that enables us to kind of see how muddy that distinction is. Mm -hmm. Whereas with religious texts, again, because they have this very specific history in terms of their genesis and usage, it can be more challenging to locate experience within a text. But at the same time, too, that feminist theology has often used women's writing, does use women's writing as one of its primary sources for exploring that which has not been explored in, in sacred texts. So you have this kind of methodological approach to using mm -hmm. women's writing, very kind of critically really. As a, as a challenge to the understandings of, of sacred texts, as an alternative voice, as a particular different kind of sacred canon, uh, claiming it in that very clear, clear way. Um, so that there's part of that kind of story too, that within, within religious feminism, the sacred text is played with its contestants. Mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, some people lose it, some people drop it, maybe not completely, others are uh, I agree. I mean, it's still a legitimating factor, one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we also have to recognise that the, you know, where the sacred text is situated differs for different mm -hmm. religious yeah, groups. So yeah. for some, it's like <coughs> uh, whereas for some Hindu groups would not really 
giving them a set of sacred texts which purchase. So I suppose it's about this sort of drawing on the religious symbolism, but that's not necessarily, um, the origin of that is not necessarily text based, it, it, it's sort of more than that. Um, so it's sort of just recognizing, you know, in a sort of Judeo Christian context, the, you know, the, the, primary, the, the, the primary way of looking at um, the text itself um, comes to dominate, but in other traditions, it might that's precisely the problem with studying religions traditionally, right? That that persuasion spills over into our investigations of traditions which are not Judaism or Christianity. And then we get ourselves into trouble by ignoring like women's writing, for instance. That's great. I think we're um, going to break now for coffee. Um, so hopefully, we <laughs> should have appeared outside. Um, thanks to the summarizers and also to the facilitators of the event.